to a, the Holy One of Israel. And yes, I do say Jesus sometimes, <laughs> so forgive me. I'm still coming out of Babylon. Uh, Jim, Jim invited me and he said, can you come out of Babylon for a week to come preach? <laughs> I said, I don't know, man. I'm still got these cords. <laughs> no, seriously, Father, in the name of Yeshua, though, we love you. Oh, we thank you for today. Um, thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for your spirit. Hmm. Lord, I ask you to help me speak today as we prepare for our next speaker, Mr. Chumney. We're looking forward to hearing from him. And Lord, I ask that you would bless him as he waits and give him revelation. Hmm. Lord, um, I ask you to bless every member of this gathering with practical wisdom into their life. Lord, we're not trying to be super spiritual here, Lord. We ask for practical wisdom. Application. Putting one foot in front of the other. Not just saying and talking about, but doing. Lord, we ask for that. In Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Well, praise God. Who's got a scratch sheet of paper that I can borrow? Jim, you got just a you got one? Just, just one. Okay. <laughs> okay, these represent the notes that I worked on all last week to get ready for this. <laughs> I woke up this morning. And as I was getting ready, I mean the Father's heart came upon me. Um, the Father's heart for coming out. And totally just said, I want you to talk about this today. That's what I'm going to do. Amen? Because especially after listening to Matt, I mean Matt's just really unpacked a lot of things. I really liked it. And Brent come with another view that just really blessed me. And I found myself, I was like, how can I be like both of those guys and get up here and talk? <laughs> I can't be like both of them. So I just got to be genuine to who I am and what God asked me to say. Amen. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. My name's Rodney. I am live in Kansas City. My wife Maria is right there. We have uh, three children, Esther, Bethany, and Jacob. And um, man, I just love being a, a father. And um, to be honest with you, I'm kind of laughing around a little bit, but I'm really quite weepy um, here the past few weeks. Buried my mom a few weeks ago. And um, it has um, been, I would say, very hopeful and sad at the same time um, going through that. My mom was saved. She was a reborn believer. And uh, but uh, it, 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 whenever death like this happens to figures like that in my life, it seems to poke on the areas that Brent was talking about. You know, those those attachments, you know, that we come through because you all know my testimony. I wasn't raised in church. You know, I came out. Had a radical salvation from many years of drug addiction. And uh, we were just talking about, you know, there's different degrees of how far in Egypt or how far in Babylon we've gone. You know, some of us were raised in the church and were taught principles that detached us from Babylonian type of beliefs many years ago. And then some of us just went deep into it and um, embraced it, loved Egypt or Babylon. And it ended up turning on us and became not what we believed it to be. And thank God Yeshua was there to reach his hand into the miry clay and pull us out. I'm one of those. You know, so you know, I've always been the one we were just talking about how, you know, a lot of times God can just pull you out of Egypt really quick or Babylon, but it takes a while to get Egypt or Babylon out of us, in which Matt talked about a lot. It's a process. 
And the Lord started speaking to me um, in 2006, right after I met Maria and we were married and we belonged to an Assemblies of God ministry about coming out from among them. And he gave me um, two, two dreams that I'm not a big dreamer. I mean, I do see visions a lot. I do. Um, ever since I've been saved. I, I don't know. It's not something I learned. I, I tell folks, I wasn't taught it. I caught it. Um, things of the Spirit. And, and, and if it wasn't for that, um, I don't think I'd be here today. He just led me by His Spirit out from deep darkness. And, and I had uh, nowhere else to go. Um, I had no knowledge of the Bible, as the Scripture says. We, we were not filled by the Spirit, by the keeping of the Torah. It was by faith that I cried out by faith. And He baptized me in His Holy Spirit without any knowledge of the Scriptures. That's just an amazing reality. And, and, and I, I know it, it rubs people wrong a lot of times because their own differences in beliefs. But I can't forsake it. It saved my life. So the way I talk and the way I move with God, it kind of offends folks sometimes. But I want to let you know I can't let it go because it saved my life. And I'd rather keep it than you. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I'm not saying that to offend anybody. Um, I can't let go of this aspect of God that's so real. The kind of God that's so real that's just He will reveal Himself to you in life-changing ways. And um, that happened to me. And, um, and I still hold on to it. And I need it more today than I did then. You know, if we really, because Brent really just brought a touch of the Spirit to me today that how much we really do need God even today. You know, and if we really got honest, we, I, I need God more today than I did when I was sitting in that crack house years ago. So, um, as I was praying this morning, I felt the Father's heart come upon me and I felt His desire for those in darkness. You know, there's a, there's a real conundrum that comes upon us with the coming out from among them mentality, which I've been hearing this and studying this for years. But we have to be careful that we don't forsake being in, but not of. Um, there's a lot of camps that have become seclusionist away from the world because of the growing darkness that God hates. And, um, but I want to tell you something. There is a uh, love for those in darkness that God has on His heart that's beyond our understanding. Um, it's beyond my understanding. You know, that's what really got me to follow God. Was um, man, the, the horrendous things that I was doing deserved hell. I deserved prison. I deserved the judgment of God. And I got none of it. I got grace. I got forgiveness. Um, it's extremely breaking to your pride when um, everything you do in life to change yourself doesn't work. And then God shows up and just breaks it all at one moment because He loved you. It just, it breaks you. It takes you to your knees and brings you to a humility that's so valuable. You know, Jacob wrestled with God and it he walked with that limp his whole life until the very end, you know. And that was that. And that's when his name was changed. And so, but God still has this crazy desire for broken people and people in darkness. Um, 
I want to start today, I'm, I've got two dreams that I do want to share that I did have years ago concerning coming out from among them, but I've first got two testimonies that I want to share about battling against seclusionism. It, and the way I say it is, is um, forsake the Jonah complex. You know, Jonah desired for Nineveh to be judged. He really did. He didn't want to go because he knew God would forgive him. Really. And after he forgave him, he was angry and left. And there he was, underneath a little bit of comfort. And God was still upset with him. And he sent that worm. And he took his shade away. And if we're not careful with the way the darkness is growing. God will take our comfort away. Because He still is that same God that wants to give mercy and forgiveness. He's slow to anger. But He's a righteous judge who is bringing a huge amount of judgment to the world. So much so that He's calling us to come out from among them so that we won't be shaking by the shaking He's going to bring. But ultimately, his heart is still good. He's a righteous, good God who's just beyond my understanding. Um, I can tell this testimony. Um, I meant Matthew. Turn with me to Matthew 18. Um, about 12 years ago, the Lord led my family my wife and I to start evangelizing in an area called Ruskin Heights. It was in Kansas City. And it was an impoverished little area. It wasn't deep in the hood, but it was at the outskirts of the hood. I, I tell folks, you could smell the hood from there. You know, <laughs> you could smell the hood. And so we were, we were evangelizing in this area. and We were bringing a lot of outreaches and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and we were seeing a lot of folks wanting to give their lives to Yeshua. And so we, but we needed to provide discipleship. And so we prayed for God to provide a house so that we could have a house in that subdivision where we could have discipleship. And lo, lo and behold, God gave a dream to a couple from Nebraska about us. Both the husband and wife had the same dream the same night about my wife and I being in that house. And they gave us the house. Signed it over to us. Just gave it to us. True story. And that's how we ended up with our house in Ruskin Heights. And so we started it as a discipleship house. Well, eventually, we came into Torah and we ended up going to Florida and then we ended up having to come back and we wanted to restore the house. And so in order for us to restore the house... My family needed to move into it, so we moved into the house so we could start restoring it to, to be a nice house. And so, and then we moved in. Um, this was a difficult thing for me to do because I can't stand the smell of the hood. I spent 20 years in the hood. Um, I don't like the way it smells. I, I, I don't. I don't like the way people behave. I don't like it. It's not godly. But God sent me in there. And He said, take your family with you. So we had three little kids. And we went in. And I've got two testimonies about things that happened to my family while we were there that I want to share with you guys. And they're very heart-wrenching for me. The first one... There was one of our neighbors, because we ended up starting a Shabbat group there, and we would have meetings, and literally people would just walk in off the street and come into our house while we were worshiping there. And they were so void of love. For some reason, they would just walk and knock on the door, and we'd hand them a plate of food, and they'd come in the house, and they would say things like, there's love in this house. And they would just break down and start weeping. Just the love that we're so used to being around. They were, when you're starved of it, when you get around it, it's like, 
oh, there's love here. And we were experiencing things like this, but there was one of our neighbors. It was a, a black lady. She had probably eight, seven or eight kids. And I mean, they were a mess. There was a different man showing up every, every day or every week. And I mean, the cuss words that came out of that house was horrendous. It was the way they spoke to them children was terrible. And them little kids used to come over. Stare at my kids and they wanted to come play with my kids. And I didn't want them to. I didn't want them to come play with my kids. I wanted to protect my children from them. And it would happen over and over and I would be like, nah, I said, you know, my kids can come over here and play with you, but you can't come here. <sighs> and it was, a. Uh, this went on for a few weeks. And then one day, they were gone. Boom. House was empty. Probably running from the law or something. This is one of the marks I'm going to have to answer to the Lord for. The Lord said, told me, you lost your opportunity. Because when they left, I just was like, where are them kids at now? I wanted the opportunity to be able to help them kids. We used to bring them food and, and all this stuff and they were just gone. God will bring you into your Ninevehs. So that we can be a witness to those who need to see it. And I do want to be honest. I want to say this that I've learned. God is more interested in them getting saved than preserving your comforts. And I don't mean this to be offensive. Let me repeat that. God is more interested in their salvation than He is in protecting your comforts. Our comforts, our addiction to our comforts hinder many times us obeying God's voice. That's one testimony. I, that, that, this one still bothers me today. I don't know where these people are at. And I think if I saw them three kids or them eight kids, whatever, however the meaning is, I'd probably try to adopt them now. I've been so um, corrected by God about that. You know, there was something I learned through this process that God loves my kids more than I love them. He can protect them better than I can. And I got to tell you, man, I, I struggle. I struggle with um, going into the darkness with kids. But I think it's something we need to wrestle with because... We have to guard ourselves from coming out. Yes, we have to come out. But we cannot come out so far to a place that we are superior, righteous, and unwilling to go back in. This is unto being a witness. And especially with us being in the counting of the Omar, coming up to Shavuot. The fulfillment of Joel 2 was an empowerment by the Spirit for us to be a witness to the nations. And, and one of the words that I've given to Freedom Hill is God has placed you at this platform like a city on the hill so as the church can see you living this lifestyle out in their presence. The last time I preached a message here was so the nations may know. So the nations may know. God is making Himself holy amongst His people so the nations may know. It's unto being a witness. And I don't want to take away at all away from the reality that yes, we need to come out. But God has told me to preach this side of it. To balance it, I think. Amen? There's another story that I want to tell. It's kind of funny on me. Um, 
we were living in Ruskin Heights still, and my wife used to get angry at all the gunshots we'd hear. <laughs> there towards the end, she was like, man, we got to get out of here. <laughs> These gunshots are coming to them. I mean, we dealt with how many years that we deal with them gunshots? Seven. I mean, we got three kids, and I'm like going, my goodness. Is, and I, I remember getting up in the middle of the night just to go in and check my kids and make sure one of them wasn't shot. You know, uh, that's how it was. And, uh, and, and it's not comfortable. It's really not. But we were to live as holy as we could amongst the people who needed to see it. They needed to see it. And it affected many lives. But there was one day I had started a business and I had, I had a, um, what, what kind of, it was a little GMC Denali. It was a little GMC Denali and it had a trailer hat and I had a trailer hooked to it and I have a cleaning company and, and I pulled my trailer and my, uh, and the Denali up in the driveway. I got home from work one afternoon and, 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 and I had to run in the house right quick. And, but I left the car running. I was just running in for a moment, you know? And all of a sudden I get in the house and I hear my wife going, Rodney, somebody's got your car. <laughs> Somebody stole my truck right out of my driveway. Just put, backed it out and took off with it. And in three days, they found it both totaled with, uh, um, with liquor bottles all in it. And uh, I'm not rich, man. I mean, we work hard to be able to have these businesses and have equipment, you know, and and I never forget, I was on the driveway after I found out it was been stolen. I was so angry. I was angry. And I was like, God, expose that guy who did this. You know, I want him to get justice. I want him to get justice. Well, see... You got to understand something. When uh, when Jesus came to me in a crack house, out in the parking lot of that crack house was a stolen van that I had stolen. And I didn't get judgment for that. I got mercy. So turn with me to the parable. Matthew 18. Verse 21, it reads like this. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children and all that he had, and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, having patience, have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord, and the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. Denali. <laughs> and he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him into prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, 
they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave? In the same way that I had mercy on you. And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. So there I was sitting on that driveway. That guy had stolen my pressure washing rig. And I was praying for God to bring justice onto this man. And the Lord reminded me of this parable. He really did. I, I mean, it was, it was, it, it literally almost took the knees out from under me when he hit me. I knew what God was saying. Are you going to hold this man responsible to repay the debt that you were forgiven? And it was literally the same type of vehicle. I immediately started praying, God, let the guy get off. Give him grace. Give him grace. Give him grace. I don't want nothing. I don't want nothing. I don't need another. I can go buy another one. Man, there, there, there's, there's a lot in that about my heart and our hearts as the days get darker. Because let me tell you, friends, it's going to get darker. There's, we can't pray away prophetic Scripture. You can't pray it away. We can get stays in judgment and things can get better for a little period of time, but they're going to get worse. And the Lord said, the love of their hearts will wax cold. Hence, bringing about the great falling away. That, that, what you're talking about, Brent, was, was basically talking about unforgiveness in the hearts of offenses, wounds that embitter the hearts with the way the darkness is growing. And um, God's warning us to be careful. Balance this message with grace and mercy. Forgiveness. Because really and honestly, what debts were you forgiven? You know? We, we, we need to be a people that are so committed to holiness. I want to break all agreement with darkness. But, so as I can have darkness removed from my flesh so that I can go in to the darkness to be a witness. You know, J Yeshua taught about this a little bit. He had a parrot, well, he had a thing. He said, the evil one comes, but he has nothing in common with me. So as I do is exactly what the Father says. I can't remember where that scripture is. I could look it up and find it. I've read it a bunch of times. I believe what he was talking about is Yeshua was all man and all God at the same time. 100% both at the same time. But his flesh had zero agreement with darkness. Zero agreement. I can't make that boast. But in the process of coming out, I am breaking all the agreements that I can in my flesh with darkness. So as when I go in, the demons have no common point to hinder me. So that I can go, I have been in drug dealers' houses and praying for witches and see them get reborn and filled with the Spirit. In covens. I have casted out demons at haunted houses. I've seen it happen. 
And it shouldn't be an isolated case. It should be happening more and more. It really should. It shouldn't be. I mean, people call me. Sometimes they used to want to call me so that I could go up in front of the church and just entertain them with all the stories of deliverances. We don't need to be a church who desires entertainment. You know? For real. I mean, there is a lost world out there who is caught up into the tentacles or umbilical cord of this Babylonian spirit and it breaks God's heart. He desires them as much as He desired me. That's when I was this morning I was getting up and that's that heart that fell on me. So, I don't want to take away at all any of the other teachings because I am in 100% full agreement. I really am. But, yeah, and all the guys that talk, and I'm sure Eddie would sit here and would, would teach, would say, yes, we need to balance this with this. We have to be guarded against, I call it a Jonah complex. You know? Praise God. God is actually wanting us to live out our Hebrew lifestyle in clear sight of unbelievers and church followers who scoff. Making us more like Him. God is going to shake the world eventually, whether you're attached or not. You know, He says, come out from among them My people. It's warning. It's a warning because of what's coming. And guess what? Eventually, he's going to start shaking and he's going to say, I have given my people long enough to come out. Now it's time for the shaking. And if we're attached by our heart or mind agreements, our lives, our businesses, our families will be shaken with the world. If we don't come out. That's why I think this conference is so important. It's, we really need to start looking at what it means. And, and I think we we're really getting a good start today. Praise God. I think uh, Matt made a fantastic analogy about the bricks in the Babylonian house are all sculpted the same. But the rocks in God's house will not be altered or cut by man. That's in the Torah. And that hit me when he said that because it's like God's building a house not cut by man at all. So it's completely different than this Babylonian house. And I'm going to share two dreams here and then we'll see where the Spirit leads there and then I'm going to be done. Praise God. <laughs> Back in 2006, my wife and I had just been married and we belonged to an Assemblies of God church. And um, I had no idea of what the Torah was at this time. I was saved by faith. And uh, I was just happy I wasn't doing drugs anymore and I was married. I was just tickled pink to just to be in the church. You know, any church was good for me. And uh, I was just really grateful and uh, what happened was, is I was went to sleep one night, and I loved this church. We had a spirit. I had a spiritual father. His name was Vinyl Thomas. That's Maria. This guy was on fire. He, he got saved when he was six and never looked back. And he, this guy was seventy five, and man, he was a chair walking Pentecostal. I loved it. And uh, he, he talked in tongues and prophesied and cast demons out. It, it was fun. I loved this guy. He loved God. And they were actually into the feast. And, and, and they were very Hebraic. We ended up finding out. But, um, hold on a second. Let me get a swallow. But one night, I went to sleep and I, and I had a dream that was impactful. In this dream, I've shared this here several times, I was drinking from a gold cup. And it had jewels all around this cup. And I was drinking from this cup 
and 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 it was fruity looking and strawberry looking and as i drank it, it it i was devouring it but in this dream i knew that in some way i was drinking from the church in some way i didn't know how i, I didn't understand but as i was drinking i looked down and there was these particles of impurity that were floating around in it and these particles of impurity in represented things that do not belong and then we found out that a lot of things in the church are not supposed to be there. And so, but I kept drinking. I just kept drinking. And at the bottom of the cup was this em reptile embryo with an eye that was looking up at me. And I'll never forget, I just jerked the cup away from it. It made me sick to my stomach. And that I heard for the first time that voice come out from among her, my people, lest you share in the sins and plagues. And I, I do want to share that this whole Torah movement, man, is of God. It is producing a people that is coming out and not accepting these particles of purity, particles of impurity that are in the body of Christ that are not supposed to be there. And He's purifying us through the Torah. And I, and I love it. I really do. It's bringing about, He's creating a, a people of holiness that's just really godly. And then the other dream I had concerning coming out from among them was a, a dream of a gate. I was, uh, Maria and I had just moved to Kansas City and I had come on staff. I was on staff with the church in Kansas City and I was at the very first Sunday service. We were still going to church on Sunday. We haven't even started Shabbating yet. I think it was 2008 when we moved there, 2007. But in this dream, I, I was a little boy and I was running towards a gate. And in this gate, this gate was the John 10 gate. And uh, there was a man standing at the gate entrance waving me in. And in John 10, it says Jesus is the gate, but there's a man standing at the gate. Some translations has him as the gatekeeper. Some translations has him as the watchman. But the, I don't think in reading this, this man at the gate is Jesus. Jesus is the literal gate. But there's a man there called the gatekeeper. And he was waving me in and I saw this man in this dream. And I was running like a child running to a carnival. I was like, man into the kingdom of heaven. And, and there was a little dog that was following me, and it was my dog Dusty from my childhood, which has a lot of personal revelation for just for me. That was for me. In which I can unpack that, but I don't need to. But we were run, I was running into the gate, and as I crossed through the gate, I never forget, there was a huge gassy cloud to my left. And in this cloud, it represented God unhindered. Okay? Remember, God unhindered. And I was running and it startled me because I did not recognize this God unhindered. I'd only known the kindness of God at this time. The kindness of God leads us to repentance. I didn't recognize this. Unhindered God. And when I stopped running, it halted my run. I was so startled. And the Lord spoke to me in this dream. And He said, I'm revealing Myself unhindered to My people so that when they see this, it will not halt their run. So we're in a time of grace to learn about the different aspects of the judging God who's coming. I mean... There is a Yeshua who's coming back that will not relent. He's not going to relent. The jealousy for His bride consumes Him. And he, I saw this warrior king coming back that will not relent. And 
He's trying to reintroduce his people to that so that they will be familiar with that. Because I feel like that's going to be valuable in the future for us to keep running and keep going. Because we're going to be exposed to these types of expressions of God in the future. Amen? So I, I just want to bless you guys with those. I think I'm really looking forward to hearing Eddie's teaching. I really am. And him unpacking, because I know he's been listening to all of us getting led by the Spirit. But uh, let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we love You. And we thank You for today. And Lord, I thank You that You came on my heart and You asked me to share today what, what I've shared. And, and I, I'm just pleased to be obedient to Your Spirit. But Lord, we pray that, that we would have the wisdom of knowing what it means to come out from among them, Lord. But Lord, taint us with Your kindness that we would be clothed with the empowerment of the Spirit to be Your witness. That we would capture Your heart for the lost. Lord, help us know how You desire all mankind to be saved. <clears throat> and that You desire the reward of Your suffering. It is Your desire. And we thank You. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.